Coming up on Arirang News. President Yoon song yeol vows to make South Korea's second largest city, Busan, a global hub in finance, logistics and high tech. His remarks came at a policy discussion with citizens in the southern coastal city, the first time it was held outside the capital. Doctors in South Korea are strongly opposed to the government's decision to raise the medical school enrollment quota. But no action has been taken yet, with the health ministry's warning that it has all the countermeasures against any sort of collective action. Donald Trump, the Republican frontrunner, says he would encourage Russia to attack any NATO members that pays too little for defense. While his remarks shocked readers of European countries, they also raised the alarm for key U.S. allies in Asia. Good evening. It's 9 p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We start with President Yoon's pledge to make Korea's southern port city of Busan a global hub for business and logistics. This came during his series of discussions with members, members of the public, the first time being held outside the capital. Our correspondent Woo Soo-young leads us off. South Korea will enact a special law to turn the city of Busan into a global business hub as the country looks to narrow regional gaps and spur development across areas outside the capital. That's according to President Yoon suk on Tuesday during the 11th round of policy discussions with citizens in the southern coastal city. Focusing on balanced regional development, Yoon extended a series of forums focusing on people's livelihoods to areas outside of Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province. Busan was the first stop, the very venue where Yoon last year pledged to usher in a local era, giving regional governments more regulatory freedom to shape policies when it comes to promoting business, creating commercial zones, education and cultural assets. With the aim of turning Busan into the country's second major city, Yoon said Busan would pursue three landmark policies to enhance people's livelihoods, boost jobs and economic activities, health and welfare services, with targeted education policies to nurture talent. He said the special law for Busan would aim to foster logistics, finance and high-tech sectors, establishing a new airport on Kadokdo Island by 2029, redeveloping the North Port and relocating the Korea Development Bank to the city to boost financing, as well as develop a second Centum commercial district to foster startups. Also emphasizing education and cultural development, Yoon pledged to support childcare and education by backing the construction of a children's hospital in Busan and also the city's major cultural industries such as film and sports. With the so-called Busan model as an example, he said efforts to develop non-capital areas would help overcome their shrinking demographics as well as the country's chronically low birth rate. Earlier in the day, the president called on his secretaries to formulate tax incentives and subsidies for firms that develop policies that encourage employees to have children. South Korea's birth rate is the lowest in the world, currently at 0.78 children per woman, and is expected to further drop to around 0.6 this year. Woo Seung, Arirang News. Also here in the country, tensions grow as doctors are strongly opposed to the government's decision to raise the medical school enrollment quota. But no action has been taken yet, with the health ministry keeping an eye on any sort of collective action. Our Choi soo explains. Amidst the debate of expanding the medical school quota, trainee doctors are treating the situation with caution instead of immediately resorting to collective action such as a nationwide strike. According to the Korean Intern Residents Association Assembly of Delegates on Monday, the association has agreed to transition into an emergency response committee while withholding further details about action plans. 
This contentious issue stems from the South Korean government's plan to increase the total enrollment quota from the country's medical schools for the upcoming year by 2,000 per year. Speculation in the medical field suggests this move might be in response to the government's firm stance against collective actions. The Ministry of Health and Welfare currently prohibits collective action by doctors and has warned of the possibility of license revocation if they disobey the Health Ministry's immediate return to work order during a future strike. Furthermore, the Ministry has prohibited teaching hospitals from accepting mass resignations from residents. However, some hospitals have indicated that there are still many avenues for collective actions within legal bounds, such as not renewing contracts. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, Park min -soo, the second vice minister of the health ministry, mentioned that it is fortunate there have been no collective action thus far and the government acknowledges the doctor's efforts to save people's lives. The government will advance its health care reform to improve working conditions in hospitals, resulting in a sustainable workplace. We sincerely urge residents to make a decision that stand by the patients. However, he added that the ministry will continue to monitor the situation, given the absence of a clear stance on future plans by the association. Last Tuesday, the government announced that it would increase the annual medical school quarter that has been frozen for 19 years from the current 3,058 to 5,058. Allocations for each individual school will be finalized by next month. South Korea currently has just 2.6 doctors per 1,000 people, far below the OECD average of 3.7. Cha Soo-hyung, Arirang News. In the U.S., Donald Trump, the Republican frontrunner, says he would encourage Russia to attack any NATO members that pays too little for defense. While his remarks shocked leaders of European countries, they also raised the alarm for key U.S. allies in Asia, including South Korea. Our Pei has more. Donald Trump, who's running for another term in the White House, told NATO members that they would need to pay their dues if they want military assistance from the United States. At a campaign rally in South Carolina on Saturday, he recounted what he described was a conversation with the president of a big country. I said, you didn't pay, you're delinquent. He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. The remarks come on the back of a NATO report released last year, which showed that only 11 of the then 30 member alliance were spending 2 percent of GDP or more on defense. And the comments drew immense criticism from European leaders. Any relativization of NATO's guarantee of assistance is irresponsible and dangerous and is solely in Russia's interests. Nobody should play or trade with Europe's security. Trump's latest comments have also raised concerns from South Korea, amid speculations that a second presidency would mean a grim outcome for the security of East Asian nations, as well as the possible withdrawal of American troops from Korea. But the former U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Song Kim, highlighted the need for trilateral cooperation, regardless of what happens in the presidential election in November. During a forum hosted by the CSIS, a think tank in Washington, he said South Korea and Japan are expected to play a more active role, noting that it's critical that the three governments continue to focus on strengthening their extended deterrence cooperation. Pound Arirang News. Turning to the Israel-Hamas war, reports say the recent Israeli air assaults targeting the Palestinian city of Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip has killed more than 100 people, including children. Eyes are on talks over a six-week pause in the fighting. Our Yoon Jin has the latest. The Israel Defense Forces attacked Gaza's southern city of Rafah and surrounding areas overnight Monday, with jets targeting different areas of the city and helicopters firing machine guns along border areas. More than 100 people, including children, were killed in what CNN called extremely intense Israeli airstrikes. According to a Palestinian media source, Israel conducted about 40 airstrikes on the Rafah region in the early hours of the morning in an area where 1.4 million Gazans have taken refuge since the conflict began. 
The White House reported that in a call with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday, President Joe Biden pushed back on the planned military operation in Rafah, telling the Israeli leader that Israel should not proceed without a credible and executive plan to protect the Palestinian civilians sheltering there. However, Netanyahu brushed off international warnings and criticism, saying that telling Israel not to enter Rafah was like telling the country to lose the war. The Israel Defense Force proceeded with the airstrikes despite a firestorm of criticism, with Human Rights Watch saying the forced displacement of Palestinians in Rafah would have catastrophic consequences, while the United Nations said it was extremely worried about the fate of civilians in Rafah who need to be protected. Following his meeting in Washington with Jordan's King Abdullah on Monday, the U.S. president said the United States is pushing for a six-week pause in the fighting between Israel and Hamas in Gaza as a stepping stone towards a longer ceasefire. As the King and I discussed today, the United States is working on a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, which would bring an immediate and sustained period of calm to Gaza for at least six weeks which we could then take the time to build something more enduring. Meanwhile, Hamas said Monday that three Israeli hostages died from wounds sustained during the intense Israeli attacks over the weekend. According to the Israel Defense Forces, two Israeli hostages were rescued Monday, having both spent 128 days in captivity. They are said to be in relatively good condition and have been reunited with their families. Israel says there are still over 130 Israelis being held hostage. Ian Jin, Arirang News. There are more signs that show Pyongyang and Moscow forging closer ties, from military to economic and cultural cooperation and to the political sector. Just last week, 100 Russian tourists visited Pyongyang on a ski trip, and North Korea recently sent a political delegation to visit Russia. Our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim Jong-shi reports. North Korea has opened its arms to tourists from Russia. According to a Facebook post by the Russian embassy in Pyongyang, 100 Russian tourists arrived in the North's capital on February 9th. The embassy said this was the first visit after North Korea opened its borders following a four-year closure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The tourists included representatives of the tourism industry and media and travelers from all over Russia from Kaliningrad to Vladivostok. It added the tourists will stay in the north for four days and get acquainted with key attractions in Pyongyang while visiting the Mashingmyong Ski Resort, known as one of the most modern major ski resorts the regime built. The recent hype in Pyongyang-Moscow exchanges hasn't stopped there. On Monday, a delegation of the regime's ruling party officials left Pyongyang to visit Russia. North Korea's official newspaper Rodong Shinmun reported Tuesday that the delegation is on the trip at the invitation of Russia's ruling United Russia Party. The delegation plans to attend an international inter-party forum organized by the Russian Party. A senior official at South Korea's Unification Ministry told reporters on Tuesday the government has no comment on ordinary interactions between Pyongyang and Moscow, but added that any illegal interactions such as arms transfers or labor dispatches will need to stop as they violate the UN Security Council resolutions. Moscow and Pyongyang have been strengthening ties ever since North Korean leader Kim Jong-un made a rare overseas trip to meet Russian President Vladimir Putin last September. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. In other news, monumental milestones were reached during Monday's markets. Bitcoin broke past the 50,000 U.S. dollar mark. And NVIDIA's market value briefly surpassed that of Amazon for the first time in 22 years. Our Lee Soo-jin reports. Bitcoin has surpassed the 50,000 U.S. dollar level for the first time in more than two years. According to U.S. cryptocurrency platform Coinbase, at 12.26 p.m. on Monday U.S. Eastern Time, Bitcoin surged 3.65 percent from the previous day. This marks the first time since December 2021 that the cryptocurrency has been valued at more than $50,000 per coin. 
The world's largest cryptocurrency was boosted by last month's regulatory approval by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission to allow the creation of Bitcoin exchange-traded funds, as well as a growing interest from Wall Street in the tech industry. The massive outflows from Grayscale Investments' Grayscale Bitcoin Trust after it received approval from the SEC to convert its existing $28 billion in assets under management into an ETF have also begun to subside. Following the approval of the long-awaited ETFs on January 10th, the cryptocurrency briefly tumbled below the $40,000 level, but has since been on an upward trend. Ethereum, the second-largest cryptocurrency, was also up nearly 2 percent to pass the $2,000 mark on the same day. And the renewed interest from investors in the tech industry was also evident when U.S. AI chipmaker NVIDIA briefly overtook Amazon in terms of market capitalization for the first time since 2002 when they were both valued at under $6 billion U.S. dollars. On Monday local time, NVIDIA's market cap passed that of Amazon's to briefly become the fourth most valuable U.S. listed company before closing with a valuation behind the e-commerce giant. The primary driver behind NVIDIA temporarily surpassing Amazon is the global frenzy surrounding artificial intelligence, further raising expectations that the chip maker may become a $2 trillion company this year. NVIDIA currently holds around 80 percent of the high-end AI chip market, leading its shares to surge a whopping 223 percent over the past 12 months. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. And on the local front, Robots are riding into our daily lives from making food deliveries to serving at restaurants. Our An Song Jin reports on where the South Korea's robot industry is headed to. A robot strolls down the street on its way to deliver a freshly packed meal without any human assistance. The company behind it, Robotis, has created indoor and outdoor autonomous delivery robots to further cement its position in the market. Based on a deep learning algorithm, the robot can detect obstacles, wait for the traffic lights, and reach its destination. It's called Kemi, which means ant in Korean. These robotic worker ants focus on short-distance delivery from restaurants and cafes to nearby offices and residential areas, while indoor robots work in hotels and offices. What would have taken me 20 minutes on a delivery app only took this robot less than 10 minutes. Pick up my meal from a restaurant and have it perfectly delivered it to me. Robots like this are becoming more and more integrated into our daily lives for added convenience. The company says it aims to fill jobs that humans don't want to do. Many people are concerned that robots will take jobs from humans, but the 3D, dirty, dangerous and demeaning jobs are already in need of workers. If robots can provide not only delivery services, but also fill labor shortages in these areas, that's the ultimate goal that would fill us with a great deal of pride. This company that develops serving robots for the restaurant industry is also looking to help with labor shortages and has more than 2,000 robots located in restaurants all over the country. Despite having a long history, the restaurant industry lacks digitalization, but that means it has a lot of potential. These types of robots have so much space for growth, since demand at other indoor environments is increasing as well. The South Korean government announced plans to provide one million robots in the industrial sector by investing more than 3 trillion won, or 2.27 billion U.S. dollars, by the year 2030. The trade ministry also aims to loosen 51 robot-related regulations that have hampered further use, especially for autonomous robots. It's great that the government amended its policies. However, the key task we have left is enhancing national competitiveness to compete with Chinese companies that receive sufficient subsidies from their government to manufacture at low prices. If the same were to be implemented in Korea, it would help small and medium-sized companies to conduct pilot services. Although there's a lot still to be done to boost the country's robotics industry, the needs of the companies that make them need to be addressed. An Songjin, Arirang News. Moving on, it's been 20 years since the Sejong Cultural Society kicked off in the U.S., promoting cult Korean culture to the American public through music and literature. To commemorate, a special concert was held. Our Lee Eun Hee walks us through.
The Sejong Cultural Society in Illinois has been working to raise awareness and understanding of Korea's cultural heritage among people in the United States. This year, the society is celebrating its 20th anniversary with a special Korean-themed concert. At the Galvin Recital Hall in Evanston, Illinois, performers included past winners of the Sejong Cultural Society's annual music competition for pre-college students. The competition itself was aimed at raising awareness of traditional Korean music. Participants perform one required piece and one of their own choosing. They are so busy studying their own standard repertoire, so we wanted our uh, required piece not too long, so uh, usually three minutes or less, and must contain some Korean musical theme. So 20 years ago, we couldn't find any piece like that. The Sejong Cultural Society has collected over 150 music pieces from talented composers who understand the goal of composing short yet creative instrumental solos for the piano and violin using Korean traditional melodies. It's these contemporary songs that were performed at the concert with the composer's commentary explaining how they have implemented the traditional elements from the original song. Carissa, who won the senior division in 2015, played Joy of Onghea, a violin solo piece based on a Korean folk song. We realized that competitions like Sejong really make a difference in young musicians' lives and help them become better artists. So I'm really honored and happy to have been able to help celebrate Sejong's 20th anniversary. One of the cultural events that are organized annually is a shijo competition, which introduces a traditional Korean poetic form of writing. Workshops for middle and high school teachers mean that more students can learn about Korean poetry. And by fostering cross-cultural understanding, the Sejong Cultural Society says it hopes to contribute to the harmonious existence of various ethnic backgrounds. I think it's not only Korean descendants, but non-Koreans also appreciate this kind of music. and. This is the time that we need more cross-cultural training, education, multicultural competency is what they need to develop. So this is just one small thing that we can add. Ian Hee, Arirang News. The temperatures have suddenly risen and the weather feels like early spring. Today, daytime temperature in Seoul moved up to 14 degrees Celsius, exceeding the seasonal average by 9 degrees. Due to the wild southwesterly winds, the warming trend will continue tomorrow across the country. As much as daytime conditions are warming up, please expect wide temperature gaps. With warm conditions, there will be places with rain between dawn and morning. The expected amount of rain is mostly 5 to 10 millimeters, while Jeju Island will receive up to 30. Morning temperatures will be mild nationwide. Tomorrow's hole will start off at 9, Busan 11 degrees. Daily highs in Gwangju, Daegu, Gyeongju, and Jeju will jump to 18 degrees Celsius. On Thursday, there is rain in the forecast and the temperature will drop a little, but early spring weather is expected to appear again from the beginning of next week. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. Well, that is all for this newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at 10 p.m. with the AI headline news. Good night.